If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 33 is where we'll take our text. Um, pray uh, for my voice this morning that it will hold out, and uh, so far so good, but uh, sometimes I run out midstream. Deuteronomy 33, and we're going to begin reading in verse 23. Deuteronomy 33, beginning in verse 23, the Bible says this, Of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. And to Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him, let him be acceptable to the brethren. And let, him di and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And as thy days so shall thy strength be. There is none like unto the God of, Jeru of, of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in the excellency of the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the, ever, are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine, and his heaven shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of health, who is the sword of, of thy excellency, and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to be in your house this morning. Lord, we thank you for another Lord's Day this side of eternity. Lord, we're glad to have a place to meet together here with your people. God, we pray that you'd stir this people up before us in a way we've not seen this far too, God. We pray that you would uh, cause us to uh, crave your word more and more, Lord, that you would encourage us with the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning, that you would fill your house where the empty spaces are with your presence, God. We pray for that. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, if you know your Bible. Uh, Moses' final address to the people. He was just before uh, crossing and going up Pisgah and getting his glimpse of the Holy Land. And then the Lord, uh, and then the Lord would bury him, or God would bury him, is what the Bible says. And, and he he was leaving his people with something. He was giving them their final direction. And we're going to look, we're, look at mostly Naphtali, but he left them each with a blessing. Now, uh, you know what? Uh, we don't have very much money, but I hope the blessing I leave for my children is to know that I am safe in the arms of Jesus. That, and, and I point you unto Christ, all of you, because that's really about all that I have Amen. to uh, share with you. Amen. But I, I'll be all right when this, work, well, when this is done. But Moses had instructions for, for the, the 12 tribes that he was about to leave behind, and, and they were great things. Uh, he begins with Naphtali and says, And of Naphtali, he said, O oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor. Now, to be Naphtali is a little bit different than the average because he says, Naphtali, satisfied. You know what? We live in a day of very unsatisfied people. And I don't just mean the world. I mean God's people. Unsatisfied. Not only unsatisfied with carnal things. They're unsatisfied with the person of God. What he, well, when he comes by and brushes by. You know, Moses yeah. just wanted to see, uh, uh, just feel his presence from the cleft of the rock. And we're not satisfied with that, right? You know, we, we want something. You know why these, they, these mega churches are going, uh, going so big right now? It's because people are not satisfied. They, they want their flesh tickled. 
They, they, they want something more than the presence of the Almighty, and so that's what they run to. But we find that an endearing trait of Naphtali is that he was satisfied. Oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord. Now, I want you to see the blessing of the Lord and the blessing of the world has always been two different things. Because, see, Naphtali, uh, uh, Naphtali, just like the rest of them, all they were getting by on is little pieces of bread about the size of a cracker. And it says that he was blessed, that he was satisfied. You know what? How long would you be satisfied on water and saltines? And we can look at it with a pretty proud look, but you know what? You get sick of it pretty quick. Yeah. And what if the saltines didn't have salt on them? Because I don't think mine did. And so you're eating a little piece of bread day in, day out with a glass of water. You know what? We get sick of it quick too. It's easy to, it's easy to criticize Israel until you put yourself into their position and that's all you had too. But I want you to see that somehow naturally understood he was full of blessings anyway. You know, this morning I'm full of blessings. Uh, God's been good to me. You know what? Uh, uh, when I go home to be with the Lord, I'll be with him throughout the ceaseless ages. What could be better? What could, you know, how wonderful it would be just to step into the presence of God. And somehow, naturally, had got down. It wasn't about manna. It was about God. Somehow, he, somehow that tribe had began to be satisfied, uh, had, had began to be glad in what the Lord provided. Oh, if this morning as we as a people, if we want power as a church and we want to be met with God, learn to be satisfied and happy with what you have instead of always, always, always want something more. Yeah. And so they were. And then he gives them the direction. The southwest area is yours. Verse 24, and of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Now, I want you to see, despite what we think in the modern days and what, whatever they're being taught out here in the school system, children are still blessed. Now, you have to raise them right or they'll be a mystery to you. But if you, if you raise them right and put the mind of God in them and put direction and discipline in them, they are still a blessing. And so the reward, if you will, that, uh, that, uh, that this tribe of Asher got was children. You know, he doesn't give that to everybody. He gives it to people he trust. He gives it to people that he know will raise them right. Uh, you know, and, and so we find then that uh, instead of being a difficulty and being a misery and being a, necess a necessity, rather the children were a blessing and they were given to God. And Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Now, I don't know if there was a little conflict over there somewhere with Asher and the rest of the bunch or what it was, but he wanted him to be acceptable. Now, we live in a day and age today, well, I don't care if it made a man or not. Women are worse about this. You know what? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Because, see, naturally, uh, Asher wanted to be acceptable, didn't he? Uh, we should desire fellowship with God's people. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, something's wrong. Uh, you know what? Uh, walking in in kinship, walking in friendship of the Lord in a church is a challenge. Even, even a group this small, it, it, it's a challenge. And, and it should be deliberately looked for. You know why? Because there's fellowship there. Uh, you know, uh, does God ever approve of division? I don't think he... The only time I see approval of division was when there was sin in the camp. And, and he took care of the problem, did he not? And, and, and so we find then that we as the Lord's people, as he has given Asher his blessing, one of his hopes was that he'd be accepted by the brethren. Let him dip his foot in oil. And if I understand that right, it, it was part of the anointing of the feet and, and that, that maybe he needed to be satisfied with being a servant. Now, I'll ask you this, are you satisfied in a servant's role? Are you satisfied, uh, if that was your job, would you be satisfied doing it? I know, uh, I, 
I know some registered nurses, some of them not even having the degree that I, some of having a two-year RN, which is fine, it's the exact same license, I learned that after four years. But anyway, the thing of it, the thing of it is, is uh, they're too good to give somebody a bath. You know what, when I get too good for that, I'll find me something else to do. I'll get Jerry to show me how to be an engineer. Because, you know what, that's just part of it, isn't it? And so maybe the little humble things that we do, maybe that's what foot washing is about. And I've been very opposed on that, but all their stuff they've ever said to me didn't make sense. But anyway, you know, maybe that is what foot washing is about, is that we don't get so prideful like Asher did. That we don't get so built up in the flesh, hey, I don't have to do that. And, and so we find that uh, Asher's desire, uh, God's desire for Asher maybe was to be taken down a step or two, and it was still a blessing. Then, uh, now I believe in verse 25, he begins to uh, address national Israel. And every one of them are applicable to this. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, meaning they were fighters and they were warriors. And as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now, they were getting a promise that they were going to be successful in war. They were going to get, they were receiving the promise when they got over to, and they finally crossed Jordan. Instead of, you know, uh, walking around and lost and walking around uh, in circles for 40 years, you're fixing to cross over. The battle is fixing to be yours. Take it, and this is the promise that's going with national Israel. You're going to be successful warriors. You're going to win this thing. You know what? You, once we convince ourselves we're losing, uh, the devil's going to win the battle. Now, uh, how you get yourself convinced that you're losing is measure yourself by the world standards. You know, and, and how foolish. And uh, I thought he was foolish then, and I still think he was foolish. Foolish. And I had a preacher tell me when I was a young preacher to keep all my outlines and make little marks on them how many people were saved and how many movements uh, was made in the service. And, you know, and I was young, and I said, listen, I'm not a scorekeeper. And he looked at me like I had three heads. And, you know, that's just it. That, that's some people's satisfaction. But my strength lies in the Lord. And as long as I'm head counting, you know what? I will always feel like a failure. But when you begin to count, when God comes down and meets with his people and begins to stir and work, that's all my desire is. You know, I, if there are two or three here and God comes down and meets with us, I would say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and so we see that that's the kind of success he wanted for national Israel. Now, let me say this. It always didn't happen. Why? Because they were not always obedient. You know why you teach your children to be obedient? It's because that's how they learn to be obedient to this. That's how they learn to be obedient unto God. And so we find then that they had a promise, but they didn't always live up to it. Verse 26, there is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. Now, Jeshurun was an old-fashioned name for Israel. It wasn't a false god. It was the God of the Bible. It's the very God, Jehovah, that we serve today. Blessed is the God of Jehoshurun. You know what? This morning, still blessed be the name of the Almighty God. I'm not uh, ashamed to use Jehovah. I'm not ashamed to use Jehovah Jireh. I'm not ashamed uh, to use uh, Jeshua because, listen, God is God. And uh, they and he says, blessed be him. You know what? Every time we hear a message and we really, really hear from God, we just seem to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Right. And, because, listen, it don't come from man. It comes from God. And, and he's the one that does the working of the Spirit. There is none like unto the God of Jesse Run who rideth upon the heaven in thy health. Now, we're really most of going to be preaching about health this morning, and the reason we need to uh, preach about health is because we need some help. You know, uh, and, and men are worse than this about women, but women have got as bad and about as bad as men. We don't like to ask for help. And you know why? It's acknowledging we can't do it on our own. Yeah. It's acknowledging 
whatever our plan was wasn't effective. It didn't work out. But listen this morning, our God is a God of help. He's there uh, to pick up the pieces when you drop them. He's there to strengthen you and to hold you up when, when, when you're about to fall flat on your face. God is a God of help. And he always has been. He always will be. He'll stand in the gap for you. He'll stand and hold your arms up when they're about to fall down. He is a God of help. And we need to begin to acknowledge our needs of him, our needs of him, more and more and more. So he says, the eternal God is thy uh, refuge. Uh, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before you, and shall say, destroy them. Now, I want you to see a couple of things, and uh, Brother Adam's been having some of this in his classes on the book of Joshua, but I want you to see that the framework was already set up. You be obedient, and I'll, and I'll destroy it. You listen to what I say. Now, you say, well, that's in the old Bible times, and we don't have an enemy today. If you don't have an enemy, you're foolish. Listen, I'll say this. If you don't if you don't have an enemy, you just don't know who he is. You've got one. And he's after you, and he's after me. Listen, he doesn't care if you're saved or lost. It, 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 it pleases him just as much to see someone split hell wide open as it does to see a Christian's life destroyed in its prime. Uh, he just is, he just is glad of both. And so we find then we need help. We, we need help on a daily basis. We need to be up under the wings. As this scripture said, we need the help of the Almighty. You know what we need in preaching? We need help. We know what you know what we need in mission efforts. We need help. You know what we need to get up every day and go work? We need some help. You know why it's so dry today? We need some help. Amen. Every time you get up in the pulpit, you need help. Amen. You need help because, listen, it's not there on your own. You need help, you need clarity of mind, you need clarity of speech. Sure. And you know what? That comes from God. It doesn't come from you. Amen. And so we, we see then that this, uh, uh, in this day that uh, Moses was reminding them, hey, this is not your battle. You gotta have some help. This is too much for you. You have to have help, and the help comes from God. Verse twenty-eight. And Israel, it, it, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. Only Israel dwelling in safety. And the fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also, also his heaven shall drop out of dew. Happy are thou, O Israel, who is likened to thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of help. Now, he is a shield of help. He is one that will get you through when there's nothing left to do. Now, uh, another thing, again, is, you know, when we think of help, we always think of the karma, don't we? Uh, needing a little money help. Uh, needing, uh, needing a little uh, trip to the doctor, trip help like that. But listen, that's not your biggest need. Your biggest need is spiritual. Right. You know what I have found every time when I go out looking for a fight, I find one. You know what? If that's your attitude and that's what you that that's your desire, you need some help. You know what? If I put scripture out on Facebook, listen, it's not to take someone down. And if it is, I need the help. I, I, I'm the one yeah, that, that's, that's in a problem. So sometimes the most difficult thing is admitting that you need help. Admitting that you're the one. Yeah, it, it, it's me. I need some spiritual help this morning. It's not Donna. It's not Sarah. It's me. I need some help. And acknowledging that is the most difficult thing you'll ever do, but it's the great, greatest blessing you'll have when it's over afterwards to say, hey, I need some real help this morning. I haven't heard from God in six months. I need help. And you know what? There was a time when people would do that. 
Right. You don't see it no more, but you, there, there was a time when people would get desperate over their spiritual condition and, and willing to acknowledge and say, hey, man, I'm cold. Help me. And uh, you, just, you, you just don't, you don't see that anymore. You don't hear of it. And I even go this far, you don't hear it preached on. And that's probably the biggest problem today is the preaching of the Word of God. So do you, uh, do you need some help this morning? Uh, I, I trust that you do. Now go with me to the book of Numbers just a little bit further back. And I'll show you some of the situations that they had gotten themselves in. Numbers 21, the first verse. Numbers 21. In the very first verse. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by, by the way of the spies, and he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. Now, I want you to see, uh, it, it's a battle prior to the, the crossing over the Jordan River. It's really a battle during that 40 years wandering around them, uh, looking for the way to Israel. And during that time, they, they are attacked, and some are taken prisoner. You know what? When you're taken prisoner, you need some help. Now, I want you to see that this is Israel. It is not, it is not the heathen around them. The heathen is taking the prisoners. And despite that they were Israelites, they were prisoners. You know what? This morning, the believer in Jesus Christ can be taken prisoner by this world on a routine basis. And listen, everybody says, well, I don't know about that. Well, I certainly know about it because I've experienced. And you know what? Despite what you think, how smooth, you remember You remember the congregation saying, speaking to us smooth things. Right. Just, just, despite how you think you got it smoothed over, it's just as obvious as chicken pox. We need some help. So they're arrested. They're put into prison. And uh, uh, they needed some help. They needed some deliverance. They needed, uh, they needed their own people to come to their aid. Verse 2. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, I will utterly destroy their cities. So they, they go unto God. God gives them a promise. Now, I ask you this this morning. Do you believe God's promises? Now, we always want to immediately think of the flesh. And he's done this for me, and, he, and hey, that's good. But listen, God's, uh, the uh, tribe of Asher, theirs was a spiritual blessing. They've been getting by on crackers and water for years. And he says, you're blessed. You're a blessed people. So, we need to be blessed. And he says, if you'll just deliver these people, I'm going to deliver them to you, and you take them out. That, that, that's how I want it done. And so I ask you this, do you, do you believe the strength of our Lord? Do you believe he is still able? Do you believe he still gets the job done after all the years it's flown by? Do you believe that God is still God, and he's the one that made this promise, and we can still take advantage? I do. I, I believe that we are still involved in this even today. Verse 3. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Horma. Now, I want you to see they believed God and then they acted on God. They got his help. See, if you don't ever uh, step out in faith, you're never going to be able to try the goodness of the Lord. See, uh, we, we, you know why you don't hear about what you used to hear? You don't see anybody stepping out. Say, yeah, I believe that. I believe God's good. I believe he can take it. Mm -hmm. I believe he's able. And you say, okay, we're going to go with it. And we get scared about money. We get scared about, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm strong enough. I don't know if I'm learned enough. And on and on and on it can go. But what we need to do is just step out. And, 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 and so that's exactly what Israel did. And he gave them a great victory. How many people do you know 
this morning that are really living in victory. I'd say if you can come up with five, you'd be doing good. That, that really live in the victory of Christ. And, and I'll go even, even further. That lives in the victory of Christ with nothing. Now, I don't know what her affiliation was, but when I was a boy, there was a woman uh, back home, her name was Miss Lily. And I will give you her last name, but I don't want to attach a family to her. But very sweet woman, old. I mean, I don't know. Uh, well, of course, I was like this, so she may not have been in her 50s, but she seemed old, old to me. And um, Miss Lily uh, got by on about 100 bucks a month. And you know what? She made it work. That was her rent, her food, everything she had. And one time Judy and I were over there, and Mama would always make us go over and take food to Miss Lily. And, and we was taking some food, and I noticed uh, uh, in her refrigerator, I said, Miss Lily, your milk's gone bad. And she said, no, keep it there, Larry. I use it for bread. You see what I'm saying? She used what she had, and you know what? I met, and she'd go up down that little road, 49 through Carlisle, and she'd go up there singing the Lord, and she'd get happy and begin to raise her hands. You know what? She was happy and content, and in every way, victorious. Was she not? Right where she was. And so we as the Lord's people, sometimes it's not so much what we have, but how we live, that is the victory in the person of Christ. And I believe it's always been that way. Verse 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Now you get that victory in verse 3 out just a little bit. Things are looking scary. Things are looking bad. I'm discouraged in the Lord. You know what? As long as you got your mind on this world, it's going to look scary. Yep. As yeah. long as you got your mind on this world, you're going to be discouraged. Maybe some of the men were talking about uh, uh, FDR taking us off the gold standard in 1936. You know what? That began communism in our country. But you know what? Our God's got this. If it's worth zero tomorrow, you know what? Only thing I know is it's worth zero. That's the only thing I can come to. We got a well, we got a well out there. At least we'll have something to drink. That's going to be better than most, ain't it? And so you see what I'm saying? Don't put your confidence in this world because tomorrow's coming, and tomorrow will be difficult. Tomorrow will be hard, and and so we as the Lord's people. Just because you have a victory today, know that Satan rises up tomorrow to get you out of the victory. He likes to live us in defeat as much as he possibly can. Verse 5, And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For, where, for there was no bread hither, is there any water? And our soul loatheth this light bread. We hate it. We, it disgusts us. You know what? Again, don't get too critical of them. But what I have found is that I bet this at least it filled a spot. Maybe not what they wanted. I bet it didn't taste like a Krispy Kreme. But it filled the place, didn't it? I was telling Don and the kid the other day, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, me and Sarah especially, we love the Yeti Chili. And uh, me and Sarah get a can out and dump, and we eat the whole thing. When I was a boy, one, and I, I truly, this is, how I had, this is how it was fixed when I was a boy. We have one of those one cans, Mama would dump it in, she'd fill another can with water, dump that in, and that'd be food for all four of us. You know what? It wasn't much, but here I am, right? Hey, Dave, uh, yeah. It, it, it filled it up. Uh, I'm alive. And, and so we see then, uh, as the Lord's people, that we just need to know the battle's coming. 
It's going to be worse tomorrow. It's going to be more difficult. And we can choose to be on our, on our sides, beating the ground, going, I hate this, I hate that. Or we can live in victory, knowing like Asher did, that it's all about God anyway. It's all in his person. So what possibly, what possibly could be wrong? Uh, First Kings. Very familiar verse of scripture, but I want to uh, read them in your hearing again. First Kings chapter 17. And we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 12. First Kings uh, 17, beginning in verse 12. The Bible, the Bible says, and she, meaning uh, the widow woman, and she said, as the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake. Now, I want you to see, you know, very familiar, the, the prophet uh, had come, he already pr pronounced judgment on the land, and said there's going to be a great famine, there's going to be no water, there's going to be no rain, and he was at the book, brook of Kidron, and God brought, uh, 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 dried up the book of Kidron, and he says, you go, and you go into town, I've prepared a widow woman to provide for you. And he goes down there, and... And she said, he said, I need some water. She's running to get it. He says, I need cake. <laughs> you know, it, 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 isn't it a bit strange? It's the very same type of simple meal that God provided all through the years of the wilderness. It, it wasn't pheasant. It, it wasn't turkey. It wasn't dressing. It was just a plain old cake. Very similar to what we would use in the Lord's table. And, and that's it. And you know what? I dare say anybody here, when we get done with unleavened bread, uh, besides the spiritualness of it and the goodness of it and the memorial that's behind it, I doubt any of us going to say, man, that bread was good. Do we? And, and, and so we find then that he makes a request to this woman, and uh, she makes a true statement. She don't, she says, I don't even have a cake. But see, what she did have is that she had something to make a cake with. And what you have this morning, if you're genuinely saved, you have something to make the cake with. Now, you may not have it on you, and you may not have it all put together, but you've got the stuff to do it. And we, as the Lord's people, we need to begin to say, okay, it's been a rough time, but you know what? I serve a living creator. I serve, I serve the God of the Bible. I serve Jehovah through the person of Jesus Christ. And you know what? I have what I need. I'm going to make me a cake. <laughs> and most of the time, we don't do it, do we? And uh, I'm not a baker, to say the very least. Uh, but you know what? If all the ingredients are out there, I can put them together. And that, that's what we need to do. See, as sovereign grace people, sometimes we think that God is going to take that blessing and just cram it down our throats. Sometimes there's a little preparation involved, isn't it? Now, uh, Donna likes to bake, has all kinds of recipes and stuff, but she spread it all out there, and I just went by and got me a handful of uh, cake powder. You know, it ain't going to taste much because they put together. It's not seasoned up. It's not ready. It takes effort. And if you come down to the house of God, I trust you're prepared. I, 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 tr I trust that you have put the ingredients together that God's given you, and, and you'll be ready to receive the blessing that he provides. That's what we need as the Lord's people is to be prepared, to be ready, to, uh, to listen to what he has uh, given us. And so she says in uh, verse 12 again, and she said, As the Lord liveth, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for my son, for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou said, but make me therefore a little cake first. And bring it unto me, and after that, and after, make for thee and for thy son. Now, I want you to notice two things. The first thing you have to overcome, if you're going to need help from God, is fear. If you're going to act now, God's help is ready and able. But see, accessing it, the devil puts 
problem after problem after challenge in front of you. And after you admit, say, hey, I need some help, it gets a whole lot easier. And then you have to get rid of that fear. And you know what the fear is? The fear is this. Is God really able? And after you say, you know what? I'm in a mess. And yeah, I really need some good help this morning. The next thing is fear. Because Satan will come by and say, you can't do that. He shoot you a bill of goods. Right. So we have to, we have to deal with fear, don't we? We have to go forward. When, when there doesn't look like there's any hope or no one left and, and everything's against you, put the fear aside. You know what? Used to when I was a young preacher, and Jerry, you remember this, I would get a little bit fearful when people didn't show up. You know what? I'm not worried about it anymore. That fear is set aside because you know what? <laughs> the very one that's supposed to be here is here. The one's going to hear the word of God. Feast on the word of God. So why do I worry about the others? I can't help them if they're not here again. Right. And so why should I fear that? Why, why, should, why should that be my worry? And, and so we then, we find as the Lord's people that the fearfulness is, is an attack of the devil. And he loves to do that. And so the, the widow woman had that to deal with. Verse 14. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of milk shall not waste, neither shall the crews of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of milk wasted not, neither did the crews of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Now, I want you to see that uh, God's promises are good. And you know what? Best we understand, no roasted potatoes came out of that bucket. Uh, they didn't eat pork, so no fried pork chops, and uh, no poultry. The same old thing day after day after day. But you know what? It filled the spot, did it not? It filled the spot. And, and they went on, and when the rain finally came, you know what? They were, they were living in the victory. See, we've been convinced by Pentecostal folks that living in victory is just woo and, and feeling good and all that mess. You know what? Living in victory is getting by while we're here. This is not our place. Why would we think for even a moment that we'd be happy here? This is not our home. Man. We're pilgrims and strangers, is what the Bible calls us. So, you know what? There's going to be some empty days. There's going to be some tiredness along the way. But listen, when it happens, get yourself up another meal. Sit down and enjoy it. Get in that word. Get in your prayer time. Find your prayer closet and begin to pray and, and seek the face of God. And I guarantee you, once you get a hold of him, you'll come out of there uh, better than you went in. And you'll be ready. You'll be ready for the next time around. Now, one more place and we're going to close. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 and verse 24. Matthew 17 and verse 24, the Bible says this, And when they were come down to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Now again, always trying to find fault with the Lord Jesus Christ, always trying to bring him down a bit. Verse 25, Peter says, And he saith, Yes. In other words, he pays tribute. He pays taxes. And when he was come unto the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom did the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or the strangers? And Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. So this was a, this was a fee for Gentiles traveling through the city. It wasn't a tax like we pay Stewart County for our little bit of land out there and we do it because we're citizens. 
It would be like someone coming through, we say just from Mexico uh, for sake, and everybody from Mexico, maybe they go out here to the hotel, and because they're Mexican, they have to pay ten dollars more. That was the type of thing. In other words, they're saying, Jesus, you're a stranger. You're you're an odd person. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Now, if they don't say you're odd, I'll say this, you're doing something wrong. Uh, doctrine of separation is a hated doctrine. It's become more hated every day. But you know what? If you're not strange and separate from this world, something is wrong. Something is wrong because they call, they call the Lord Jesus a stranger. And Peter saith unto him of strangers, and Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free, meaning Israel. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, Go thou to the sea, cast a hook, notice no bait, and take up the fish that first cometh up, and then th that has opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take, and give unto them for me and thee. Now, I want you to see the provision came for Christ. Now, what would have been the easier way to do that? What did they have that Judas carried? The Bible, right? How much easier is it to go fishing for a fish that Jesus says has a coin in it than just reaching in the bag and saying, there you go. See, God's plan is not always man's plan. In other words, I want you to do it the hard way. I want you to do it the way that requires trust. You know, uh, I don't even know how many fish we begin to we could begin to save us in the Cumberland River. But what's the likelihood, without bait, casting a hook into the Cumberland River and pulling out a fish that has a gold coin in its mouth? See, that's God. That's when you look, that's when you begin to understand and know that the blessings come from God and they're not yours. You know what, church? We need some help. Let's go look for it. Let's go obtain it. More than that, let's go claim it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that there is an ever-present help in time of need. We need that this morning.